In this video we're going to look at energy transfer. When we talk about energy transfer in systems, mostly we're talking about one animal eating another animal and absorbing its energy for use for respiration. One of the ways we can show this energy transfer is through a food chain. We see that we've got an oak tree, which is eaten by a caterpillar, which is eaten by the blue tit, and the blue tit's eaten by the sparrowhawk. So we've got a chain. Now, a food chain is a single line showing transfer of energy within an ecosystem. Now, you'll notice that the arrows go from the blue tit to the sparrowhawk, or is eaten by. And this is because it shows the flow of energy. So the blue tit's energy becomes absorbed into the sparrowhawk. Very important that the arrows go in this direction. Okay, it's something that a lot of people confuse and get them around the wrong way, but it's showing flow of energy, so you need to remember is eaten by or goes into. We have our different trophic levels that are shown in our food chain, uh, starting with the producer at the bottom. Producers can also be referred to as autotrophs, uh, and both trophic levels and autotrophs comes from the Greek word trophos, which means pertaining to food. So autotrophs mean self-producing uh, self food. So we've got the producers. The producers are eaten by primary consumers. Uh, sometimes you'll see this written as a first order consumer. The first order consumers are eaten by secondary consumers or second order consumers, which are eaten by tertiary consumers or third order, order consumers. Uh, and all consumers are considered heterotrophs, meaning that they have to get their energy elsewhere. Uh, or, sorry, get their food elsewhere for the energy. Uh, there is sometimes another level in some ecosystems, the quaternary consumer or the fourth order consumer, but due to uh, energy loss between the trophic levels, which we'll get into shortly, uh, most food chains don't go any further than that. Food webs are a little bit more complicated and it's basically just bringing in uh, multiple food chains together to make a food web and it shows when uh, one thing is eaten by a number of things or eats a number of different things uh, and it's a bit more like what the actual ecosystem is. And in our ecosystem we have uh, again, we can talk about food and the food that an organism eats. Uh, we have a few more words. We have herbivores. Herbivores eat plants. Carnivores. Carnivores eat meat. And as you probably know, there's also omnivores, which eat a mixture of meat and plants. I mentioned energy loss between trophic levels before. Now, what this means is that not all of the energy consumed by an animal goes into that animal growing. In fact, it's only a very small percentage that goes into the actual growth of an animal. Uh, other portions of the uh, energy will be used for heating the animal, for the animal to be able to move around, uh, and some of it's not digested at all and goes straight through the digestive system. So, and in this example, we've said 20% of the food that's come in is for growth. Uh, in other animals, it's closer to 10%. So it's very, uh, a lot of the energy is lost from one trophic level to the next. So putting a numerical value on that, uh, if there was 10 joules of energy, okay, and energy is measured in joules, 10 joules of energy in a plant, and the deer were to eat that 10 joules, nine joules would be lost to the environment, and only one joule would go towards it actually increasing in size. Once you start having a few trophic levels, the amount of energy loss becomes quite substantial. So for example, in this case, looking further, uh, we had a thousand joules of light energy. So only 10 joules would be, was able to be harnessed by the producer uh, and used for growth and 990 was lost to the environment. So then when we talked about the deer, it ate ten, the 10 joules that was available and lost nine to the environment, only using one uh, 
which was available for it to increase in size. Now that one joule then goes to the carnivore, so it's losing 0.9 of a joule and only has 0.1 of a joule to actually increase in size. So you can see that the carnivore needs to eat lots of herbivores, uh, so in this case the lion needs to eat a number of deer to get the size of a deer because of that energy loss. So it needs to eat about 10 times uh, as many things by weight. And this is where the biomass or the energy pyramid comes in. So the oak tree is the same as our uh, grass from before. It gets its energy from the sun and not all of the energy that it gets from the sun is going to be used in growth. Now that growth and well, only what's used for growth is available for the caterpillar to eat and it's going to lose quite a bit large proportion of that energy to the environment before it passes its energy on to the blue tit and before and same thing for the blue tit to the sparrowhawk so for a sparrowhawk there needs to be a very very large population of caterpillars so that the energy can get up to it. And you can see that these different levels show the different amounts of available energy at the uh, different traffic levels. We also call these biomass pyramids. And biomass is the total dry weight of something. So if you were to take all the water out of it, it's the total mass in an organism. And this makes sense in that if we were to look at, rather than biomass, if we were look at, to look at population, one oak tree would be able to support thousands of caterpillars. But if you took the size of the caterpillars compared to the size of the oak tree, you would get a better idea of the energy uh, that is moving from uh, traffic level to traffic level. So this is why we use biomass pyramids. Most of this video should have been a refresher from junior science and just to get our heads around some of the terms that we use when describing these uh, food chains, food webs and biomass pyramids.